Hello everybody. Today we are going to talk about how to build, deploy and scale your Django one single page applications using GraphQL endpoints. So before I begin, let me tell a little bit about myself. I am Dilip Shiva. I am an optimistic nihilist, democratic socialist and I code for fun and profit. I love science, Python, FOSS and Tamil which is my mother tongue. I am a dad of two and an environmentalist, storyteller and a gamer. I'm a jack of all trades, but master of none. And I volunteer for a lot of progressive movements, you know, around the globe. So before we begin a standard disclaimer, I have no idea what we are talking about. Uh, I, uh, you know, play around with a lot of things, front and back and mobile applications, IoT, uh, you know, as long as it's coding, I love to, you know, um, experiment with different things, uh, which is why I'm a jack of all trades and I end up having, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, breadth about a lot of things but not enough um, you know not enough depth so about my credentials I have uh, about 11 plus years of experience in uh, python i built over uh, 20 different products using you know just django alone i've scaled more than five products to serve more than five uh, you know to serve nearly uh, millions of requests per second i built a device farm uh, ios and android device farm uh, you know, which was used for security testings and I was involved in building a Bitcoin mining farm with Raspberry Pi and custom ESC chips. Uh, it is sort of like an AWS for uh, Bitcoin miners, if you will. And as for my profession, I work as a VP of engineering at Reconsys and I work as a Hito Shikage at a non-profit called Intimis. Let's get this question out of the way. Why GraphQL? It's much more standardized than the fragmented RESTful implementations. You know, everybody have their own flavor of RESTful implementations and, uh, and you know, it's, it's all about their own preferences, but that the same thing cannot be done in GraphQL. Um, GraphQL has this very specific stretch of format that you'll need to follow. In GraphQL, you get, you get a live and browsable documentation out of the box. There is no need for you to, you know, maintain a different uh, API documentation like you would do with uh, swagger or or any other thing which is used for rest there is no back and forth communication between the api developer and the react developer so uh, usually every graphql endpoints give a, a graph iql explorer where you are free to sort of like uh, you know explore all the queries and mutations and subscriptions and types and whatnot uh, and and you can write very precise queries in restful framework uh, it doesn't matter if you just need like two fields or if you need a bunch of fields or if you need like less nested levels of fields uh, it'll always return you the same response uh, but that's not the case with the uh, graph uh, with graphql you can write like very precise queries you can request for what you want uh, if if you want n degree of you know nested uh, uh, response, you, you are free to do that. Assuming you know GraphQL allows you to uh, do such queries. So let's take a look at our very buggy demo application, uh, which 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 I call uh, you know the Stack Open Flow. Um, it's a very silly clone of Stack Overflow. So let's go and register ourselves a user for now i'm just going to call them uh, test user which is the username and test user which is the password let me register okay it says now it is successfully registered and i'm going to log in as the test user So as you can see, there are no questions on our system at the moment. So let's go ahead and add a question. Uh, how to do join operations in Python? How to join an array of texts in Python? Fine. So this is a sample question that we want to ask. As you can see, as soon as the question is added, uh, it says there are zero ports, zero downloads, and there are no answers. So let's go ahead and add a new answer. Let this answer be, uh, you know, uh, foo bar, and then we just simply join. We just simply do a space dot join of one but this is going to sorry this is going to 
do a join operation on array so let's submit that answer so here is the first answer right so the first answer uh, which is given by uh, me the same test user is you know join foo and foo you can add comments so if you see there are no comments here uh, i'm going to add a new comment saying thank you submit and then and there is the comment fine and you can upvote on a comment or you can you know downvote on a question uh, fine so that is it so that is our entire application now that we know what our application is all about let's uh, dive into the tech stack that we've used here so it is on on the back end it's built with you know python django i've used this library called the graphene library uh, which is used for graphql implementations and there is Gra django graphql jwt it is sort of like a, it's a it's a it's a plugin for graphene library if you will where you can have jwt uh, token based authentication and we have used Django rules. I just put the Django rules as a as a uh, as a hint here, you know, as sort of like a recommendation that you could use that uh, upper object library, upper object permission library that you could go for. And I've used the Postgres database. On the front end, it's uh, JavaScript with React, and I've used uh, Relay, and I've used ECPC state management uh, library. Uh, so graphenes have custom fields the code is synchronous you can only write synchronous code with graphene it's more mature it is the status quo and it has a fantastic integration with django on the other hand using strawberry rocks uh, the schema definition is completely based on data classes it's it's asynchronous uses async io uh, it's not so mature uh, you know it's, it's being a relatively new library and all uh, maybe it is the future because it looks really nice uh, but at the moment it has a very minimal Django integration so it made sense with to go with the graphene let's take a look at per object permissions or row level permissions if you will so choose a rule based framework rather than choosing a database based uh, framework uh, a rule based framework like Django rules uh, would not uh, hit your database for checking if a user has permissions or not because it's completely based on rules and you can just represent within Python code but in libraries like Guardian uh, you will have to uh, set these permissions on the on the database so for each permission check you make it makes a database call so which means uh, Django when you're using Django rules there are less DB calls which means less latency there's no unnecessary migration due to change in logic so uh, permissions right they change every now and then you 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 come up with a team strategy and then you decide uh, you know maybe that's not the right thing to do and then you want to change it to something else or you add new roles uh, so when you do things like this right you'll have to go back and add migrations because all your permissions are relying on your database now so which is which is something that you can totally sidestep if you're using a library like django rules and it's easier to maintain uh, you know compared to uh, frameworks that depend on db to uh, you know apply permissions so let's take a look at our project layout so this is my backend repository and as you can see i have a stack overflow root root up here so basically the stack overflow open flow is where uh, is the one that has you know your uh, settings.py and wsj.py so if you've read uh, books like two scoop of django they uh, recommend you to keep configurations in a separate folder like config which is not something that i like uh, it's just a matter of a personal preference is it that i like my things uh, being namespaced all the settings uh, you would not access namespace to access it you will just import it from django.conf uh, so i'm just saying it's nice to have everything within uh, you know under the same name under the same namespace and that's sort of like the uh, 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 you know base layout that we've been following here at reconsys for all our projects uh, so that is that um, and and inside uh, stack of openflow we have uh, you know apps like contrib core and q a say stack overflow graphql uh, as you can see everything is namespaced in the stack overflow uh, which is something that i like 
and then uh, typically right when you create a Django app you would find uh, admin.py apps.py models.py test.py and views.py and everybody knows what these files test or else I have no clue what you're doing at Django.com um, so but in our modules uh, we have these files uh, there is admin apps uh, which is uh, which is by default that's there and then behaviors is where you keep your behavioral logic like commentable or uh, votable uh, things that you're able to do as a user right uh, so that's that's where it goes into behaviors.py and then choices.py is basically uh, uh, you know where you keep all your database choices inputs.py is like forms.py uh, you know when 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 you want to get a bunch of uh, input from the client side uh, that's where you put your definitions at and everybody knows what model start by is and then mutation start by uh, as uh, so if you notice there is no view start by so instead of view start by there is two more files now which is mutation start by and query start by so the mutation start by as the name says it has all the mutations and queries have all the queries and then we have types types is sort of like your serializers right uh, it contains all the definition all, all the payload definition that uh, that GraphQL uh, responds back to the user with. Um, so let's walk through the source code. First, I would like to walk you guys through the backend code, right? Um, so let's open code.py and in the code.py, let's go through, you know, some of the files. So basically we have this choices.py this choices.py is nothing but uh, you know all the choices all the database choices uh, that the models have so for example there there could be an admin type of user or a client type of user uh, there might be different types of uploads you can upload a profile picture or you can upload an excel report or, or something like that right and then i have an upload status I have an upload status which says what's what what's the upload what's the upload status so basically this choices.py file has all the uh, all the db choices and in the models file you can see uh, there is a base model so basically we use uid as the primary key and then the user has a user kind and then there is an upload object there is an upload model uh, which is used for tracking all the uploads that are done to the system and, uh, we have our inputs.py right which is more like forms.py it will have uh, just you know uh, it will say what will the what are all the inputs that the graphql uh, expects so for instance the register input right so at the time of register we only require username and password uh, so if you were to look for the register input uh, you would find that there is username and password feel free to ignore the client ID mutation which is nothing but a relay uh, which is just which is nothing but a property that's added by relay so you can safely ignore it uh, and then we have types.py uh, so every model typically will have a type dot file uh, associated with it it's like uh, Django uh, serializes it's like Django model serializes if you will uh, so here here is for example the upload right the upload in in this uh, place it can have a pre-signed post url generally speaking what people will do is that they'll upload from their browser to their server and then server uploads to s3 and then returns that uh, response back to the browser so let me tell you why that is very problematic say uh, you just have two servers right um, and and there are uh, there are hundreds of people trying to upload huge files and that's going to be a problem because everybody is going to be uploading to the same file and let's say you also have to redeploy your code during this time uh, you know it's not easier to do that because there is active uploads that are going on so that is something that, that we should actively try to avoid uh, that uh, the indirect upload to s3 through uh, the servers we should try to avoid it so what i usually do is i i create a pre-signed url i let the browser upload the file directly to s3 and once it's finished uploading it will make a mutation call so let me just walk you guys through the mutations here so this is the uh, mutations files here so as you can see there is a register muta mutation which means it's the mutation that uh, you know sort of like registers new user i create new user objects here as you can see uh, and then there is a create upload and finish upload so the function of this create upload and uh, finish upload is that when you say create upload it will create a new upload object and it will respond back to the user with an upload object uh, and what we do is when we are getting this upload object since 
the upload the return type of upload object is um, you know is is an upload type the upload type uh, if if you look at the upload type the upload type will automatically have a pre-signed url so when it resolves it's going to generate a pre-signed post url and it is going to return it to the user so when we get the pre-signed post url on the browser we are going to upload it directly to the s3 uh, and then we make another call saying so once it's finished uploading to s3 we make a call saying finished upload mutation so uh, in this finished upload mutation we are just going to send the uh, id of the uh, upload and it will immediately set it to upload it mm, and then it will just end uh, and then if there are any uh, so this at the moment is not a valid task it's it's not actually there it's there just for demo purposes so if you want to do some post processing right so for example you uploaded a file object and you want to you upload a profile picture and you want to optimize uh, you know the size of it using image magic or something that is something that you could do within uh, you know within tasks like this uh so that is all your mutations and then we have all our queries so queries are nothing but you know all the uh, fetch calls so that's where you fetch your data from and mutations is when you alter something in your database so that's the difference between queries and uh, mutations basically so we uh, so for uh, so we have like me query which means it will return the currently logged in users uh, input we have the uploads query and we have uh, the relevant uh, you know resolve methods for each of these things so uh, these are some uh, these are sort of like you know additional uh, files that we'll be creating uh, when we are using graphene uh, but uh, the score app is a bit special it has even more uh, additional things as you can see it has decorators.py which is basically it has all the login required decorators you know if the client required decorators and so on what uh, whatever decorators you need you can just keep it over here say for, for say for instance i'm going to call uh, i'm going to query uh, all the content types uh, in the system and this content types will have an id label app label and model uh, so when i run this i get a bunch of responses back uh, and then we have a storage.py the storage.py is nothing but it just has a bunch of regular uh, 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 helper functions to sort of like upload uh, upload files directly to s3 from browser and then uh, generate pre-signed url keys uh, and and so on right so it has all the helper functions to interact with s3 basically so that is it so this is all uh, this is all the files that are in the core so let's look at all the files that are in the QA. &A. QA &A is nothing but you know it represents all the questions and answers that are uh, used in the system uh, question answers words and comments um, so let's have a look at model right so basically we have uh, we have things like vote comment questions and answer uh, the vote as you can see it's a generic foreign key because you can apply vote to uh, um, any object like answer question or comment you can use the same table for all the three uh, entities so that's why it has a th that is why it has a generic foreign key and the way that you refer it from your comment uh, from your uh, uh, referred object is that you use a generic relation so as you can see here we have used a generic relation and we have said uh, votes is basically a general relation to vote fine and then we have questions uh, uh, which is which is basically what questions and then we have our answer entity uh, which stores all the answers and as you can notice uh, all the models have custom managers fine uh, which is defined in behaviors.py so if in behavior if you, if you were to look we have a bunch of things like uh, votable query set uh, which is uh, you know if any object any object uh, that that the user can vote on can exhibit a votable behavior so it has a votable query set it can have an upward count downward count and a total vote count and then we have a commentable query set which means uh, you know these are the these are the models on which the users can comment on uh, so so that is it and then we have a vote count right which is nothing but a case when statement to count the number of upvotes and downvotes so this vote count is nothing but just a complex query which will uh, count the number of either uh, the the given vote kind which is either you know here as you can see it's either upvote or downvote uh, it will collect all the number of votes it has and 
uh, and then fi finally the total vote is going to be the number of upvotes minus the number of downvotes so as simple as that uh, so that is it and and if you were to look at uh, the queries.py uh, this queries.py is now going to uh, you know uh, so since you uh, since you use query set as managers you get to do things like this with vote count and with comment count right so this thing will annotate your query set with relevant uh, data so that uh, it can be picked off uh, on the client end as well i've seen many people uh, you know struggling to represent generic foreign keys in rest or api calls i need to trick to take care of it which is like uh, resolve comment so this resolve comments basically will take an object id and the content uh, content type id and it will it will get all the all the comments for that specific uh, object id and content type id so how do we define this content type id uh, so if you if you were to look at the core queries if you were to look at the core queries all the content type are listed here so let's just play around with the GlaphQL Explorer for a little bit before moving on. So as you can see, all the queries and mutations that we defined in uh, those files are, are here. You know, every queries and mutations that you defined are here. And let's try to make a sample query, right? So this you can forget. So we are going to take all the, get all the content types first. So when you run this, as you can see, it gets all the content types. So it gives like a really nice documentation that you can explore around with and you can also play uh, live uh, with whatever data that you have on your local. Uh, so this is a really, uh, this is a really uh, handy tool to have. So we also have history here on the on this history button. If you just click on the history, it will show all the, the past 20 or so, uh, you know, queries and mutations that you have done. Uh, so let's look at this input mutation tree. Right? So this is a login mutation. So for, exam for example, I'm just giving a username and password, which is hard coded here. And I'm just going to run it. And as soon as I run it, run this mutation, I get a token back. And uh, you know, any further uh, calls to the log, uh, to the views that are protected by login required, we send them with J uh, JWT tokens, uh, with these JWT tokens. Uh, so that is all about the client side. Uh, that is all about the Django server. Let's take a look at the front end app, which is Stack Overflow app uh, on my on my local. This is where I have it. Uh, so I'm already inside the source folder. I'm not going to worry about the things that are outside the source folder. Uh, we are only interested in things within the source folder. So as you can see, I have a command here. So let me just show you guys that command. So I have uh, app export. Fine. I have this. I have this management command called app export. So when I run it, it's going to it's going to export the choices.js and the schema.json from our repo to uh, the uh, react repo. And in the react repo, you get to see what are all the choices. So uh, every choice that you declared in choices.py is now available in your choices.js. So when it is exported like this, you can do things like uh, routes questions vote so this is a vote component right so this basically has a vote button uh, it has upward button and down vote button so basically what i can do is that i can import these choices fine and i can just say choices dot vote kind dot down or choices dot vote kind dot up okay and then let's now uh, you know have a look at uh, the non-production deployment which is using vika again uh, the the source code is located right over here i have forked it uh, let me just open dj con eu bigger or should dj con eu 2021 bigger Okay, so I hope the font is visible. So this is nothing but, uh, uh, you know, this is nothing but a generic Docker Compose boilerplate. So if you were to open this uh, Docker Compose, so, 
So Bega is nothing but just a generic uh, Docker Compose boilerplate, which uh, which we use to deploy, you know, for non non production workloads. Uh, the reason that we use uh, Docker Compose is that you know we don't want uh, most of the clients that we have uh, they, they they don't have huge or deep pockets. Uh, most of the times you know they spend money out of their own pockets to sort of build their own product. They don't they have not even raised funding, so we don't want to put a lot of bill for them. I mean we don't want the, them to get a lot of bill from AWS, right? So what we do is just we take a five dollar server. Uh, we create a five dollar server through uh, uh, you know docker machine and we deploy it using docker compose so this is like a sample configuration of the docker compose right this is not the actual thing like we don't use this these services and all so it's just here for a reference reason but as you can see there is going to be a worker uh, instance uh, which will uh, you know which will build your backend folder uh, and then we have the configurations to run beat and backend uh, from your worker uh, from your worker service. Uh, this here we use this thing called traffic, which is a uh, which is a pro which is a reverse proxy. Um, uh, the advantage of using traffic is that you know when you are using it within Docker Compose, you can just say where the sock is, where the Docker dot sock file is. So once you mount it onto the traffic, uh, it'll automatically uh, you know load balance within your containers. It'll automatically reroute all the traffic. Uh, you don't have to do much of any configurations to uh, you know like you would do with nginx uh, because this is cloud native. It is supported by the CNCF foundation. If you guys have not already checked up, checked it out, you should really check it out. Uh, so this is a project that's worth checking out. So all the documentation is, is you know, it's it's clearly uh, it's, it's written step by step over here. If you guys have any doubt, be sure to write me an email. I'll be sure to respond to you guys. And then AWS Copilot. This Copilot is an interesting utility, right? Uh, and then we have and then we have AWS Copilot for all the protection uh, deployment. So AWS Copilot is basically uh, a helper uh, CLI tool which will help deploy your applications on ECS on uh, AWS Fargate. So AWS Fargate is basically a serverless containers. Uh, uh, you know, it's very reliable and, uh, uh, and it's very easy to scale because it has like uh, all the scaling configurations built in. You just have to specify the threshold for your CPU and your memory in your manifest files. Once you do that, uh, as as soon as your uh, as soon as your uh, you know usage your resource usage uh, meets one of these uh, uh, meets one of these. Um, as soon as your resource usage meet, uh, crosses one of these thresholds, it will automatically scale your containers. So it's like very straightforward. So it's always software engineering is always about trade-offs, right? So for being vendor dependent, uh, you lose, uh, you gain, you gain a lot uh, in terms of scalability and reliability. Uh, and and this is very useful for teams like us because I've always exclusively worked with small teams, uh, which usually is, uh, doesn't go more than ten people. And uh, you know where uh, where we don't have a lot of specialized roles, uh, so this is like really handy for people like us, um, and it's cheaper than Lambda uh, serverless functions uh, because I, uh, it's not only cheaper, it also has uh, low latency compared to Lambda functions. And as for the and as far as this uh, single page application deployments are, con are concerned, uh, don't let your server. Uh, you know, handle static files. Uh, it, it's an unwanted load on your server. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's going to introduce some latency and and it might not be that reliable. The way to do it is just uh, you know build your uh, build your single page application, push it onto S3, have it uh, proxy through a CloudFront uh, CDN, and then uh, attach a ACM certificate to your CloudFront CDN if you have a custom domain, which will give you free SSL certificates. So this way it's much cheaper than alternatives like Netlify and it has let la less latency compared to when you're trying to serve from your own servers. Um, and, and then there are different ways to go about it. If you want, uh, if you want an automated deployment, again, this comes from the same Biga repo, uh, DJCon EU 2021. So if you were to visit the Biga repo, uh, we have a S3 front-end deployment script here. Uh, 
uh, which is like manual thing and I have a pi invoke task so this is my pi invoke task for setting up ACM S3 and uh, CloudFront and th and this is the same thing only uh, you know this is done manually there are about some 54 steps so that's it folks so I guess that is uh, all there is to talk about so I'm um, my handle is Dilip Shiva on both uh, Twitter and uh, link on github you can reach me uh, using the handle or if you want to mail to me it's Dilip Shiva at pm.me uh, or if you want to text me it's it's still I'm, I'm also available as Dilip Shiva on telegram uh, thank you so much for your time guys